So what is the Fourier transform? And I'm just going to give an intuitive explanation here. There's another video on the channel that explains the actual Fourier transform equation. So I encourage you to check that out. The details are in the link in the, below this video. But intuitively, if you have a signal, and it might be as uh, any signal, maybe my voice signal in time, uh, and uh, it's we've measured it, and we can uh, it has this form, then you can represent it in terms of the time domain, like this picture here, or you can represent it in another way, and this is what's called the transform. So the Fourier transform is just an equivalent representation of the signal. It happens to be, if this is in the time domain, then the representation is in the frequency domain. And we use a capital for the signal in the frequency domain and a lowercase in the time domain. That's convention. So I'm going to uh, draw uh, some examples of these here and to discuss some of the, uh, give a bit more intuition into them. So what do we mean by representing it in the frequency domain? Well, it turns out any signal can be made up or composed of sinusoidal components. And that's the essence of the Fourier transform. And what do I mean by that? Let's, let's take a bit of a look. Um, let's say this signal, which might be my voice, uh, is a, it, would ha it has a, a low-pass characteristic. And what do I mean by that? Well, I can only make sounds from my voice up to a certain frequency. So maybe I'll call that frequency bandwidth W. That's the highest frequency component I can make by trying to make the pitch of my voice higher and higher. And so all of the uh, frequency components of my signals that I can make are at frequencies lower than that value. Now here I'm drawing a negative value. What do I mean by that? I'll talk about that in a minute. And again, there's more videos on the channel about what negative frequency is if you're confused by that. But these two See, these two are equivalent representations and we put the Fourier transform here that you can either write it down this way with an equation that makes this signal or you can write one down with an equation in terms of the frequency and they are equivalent and that's why it's called a transform. You can transform in one direction, you can transform back. Let's try and intuitively understand a bit more what we mean by this frequency domain. Let's look at some examples. So here's an example of a cos a waveform. Okay, I'm going to take a cos waveform, let's say yt equals cos of 2 pi f1 of t. So that's the waveform. I can write a mathematical equation down for it and I can plot this waveform. The cos waveform starts at when time equals zero, it starts at one and it, uh, it oscillates like this. And I think we're familiar with this and it of course goes negative time as well um, and this is the waveform the cos. So this is has one frequency component. I think we're familiar with that. A cos oscillates at a given frequency. And I'm, I've called this frequency one. That's what I've drawn here. So in the frequency domain, hopefully it's intuitive to think about that and to think, well, it's just going to have a single, this particular waveform is just going to have a single frequency component. Let's say I draw that here. I can represent that by a delta function because a delta function is something that only exists at that exact value. So it only exists exactly at f1. And again, I'll come back to why we have negative in a minute. Um, but this would be y of f, capital Y of f. And this would be, I think, hopefully it's intuitive to think if you've got a cos waveform that only has a single frequency in it, like it is just at one frequency, then in the frequency domain, there would be no other values of frequency, only the value at f1. And therefore, because there's infinitely close frequencies available to us in this continuous range of frequencies, this needs to be a delta function. Okay, and if the height of this is one, then the height of these two, because we've got positive and negative, is going to be a half. And again, I'll come back to more of that in a minute. But just intuitively, a cos waveform with one frequency has one component plus its matching negative. Okay, so what about if we had another one, let's say another cos waveform, but at a higher frequency? Well, this is just a waveform, looks like this in the time domain. Uh, this should, of course, all these peaks have the same height. I'm just sketching it quickly here. But let's say this was a ZT 
Again, I can write that as a mathematical expression here um, in, in terms of cos of 2 pi F2t. Again, a mathematical expression in the time domain, or I can represent it in the frequency domain with a mathematic uh, with a, a, a plot at ft. This is a higher frequency, so it's going to be higher up than f1. So this is where f2 is, and then of course a matching a negative, which I'll come to in a minute, f2. Okay, now this is this will be z of f. Okay, so this is the Fourier transform. We're transforming from the time domain to the frequency domain. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's think now about what we would have if we had a continuum of these all at different frequencies. So I th hopefully you can see that if we had different amounts of each of these different frequencies and many, many more at all the different frequencies, then all these delta functions could be infinitely close together. You'd have all the range of frequencies available to you and different amounts of all of those frequencies, if you add them up in the right way, they will give you this signal here. So that's the essence of the Fourier, uh, Fourier transform, is that a signal can be made up of sinusoids and coses at different frequencies. If you add them up with the right weightings, you end up with the signal that you have here. Change the weighting slightly, you get a different signal. And we can look at it in the time domain, or we can look at it in the frequency domain with how much of each of these frequencies is going to be represented here. If you're adding them all up, then these will all come on the one axis, and you'll have contributions from multiple uh, sinusoids with different weightings that go together, uh, give you an overall frequency domain picture that matches and, and corresponds to and is equivalent to this frequency domain picture here. So let's just understand about these negatives and just get one more uh, insight into uh, how they all add together and so on. Uh, let's think of another frequency, or sorry, another signal, which is at the same frequency as this one here. So it's still at F2, but let's say it is a sine waveform. So let's just think about that for a minute. So this is sine of 2 pi F2t. Uh, so each sine wave starts at zero and goes up to one and has the same, I'm trying to draw this at the same number of oscillations as the one above, but it started at zero. So it has the same frequency as this one here, but it's got a different phase. And so what does that mean over in our Fourier transform domain? Well, it's still going to be two spikes because it has the same frequency component. And that's really all I've talked about so far. So what am I missing in this picture? because these two things can't be the same. It can't be, these two are the same picture. Uh, this is a Fourier transform is a unique transform. So if you've gone from this waveform over to here, if you go back to here, you would have to go back to this waveform. But if you, if you can see here, these two match the same. So there's something that's missing. And the answer is, and this is why we need the negative, the answer is that at every frequency, there are two different signals that, can be, that are orthogonal. And they, they, can be, they are the sign and the cos. Okay, and therefore we need two components in the frequency domain. And this is really one of the main reasons for us needing complex numbers. Okay, so let's explore that a little bit more here just for a minute. So let's uh, remind ourselves, uh, and we'll use this as an example. So sine of 2 pi ft, uh, uh, 2 pi f2t, uh, that can be written as, in complex numbers, uh, 1 divided by 2j of e to the j 2 pi f 2 t uh, minus e to the minus j 2 pi f 2 t. So that's hopefully something you remember um, a, a, from basic complex numbers and their relation to sinusoids. And so now let's think about this one. So here we have a positive, this is a complex number at a positive frequency of f 2. So that relates to this delta function here. And this is a complex number at a negative frequency. So the j 2 pi t, but if you pull the negative into the frequency, that gives us this component here. So these two complex numbers, this one relates to that delta function, this one relates to that delta function, and so far we've been plotting, we now hopefully you can realize that so far we've been plotting the magnitudes but because it's a complex number, we need also to be plotting the phases. So let's just look at that in this example just for a minute. So the 1 on 2j, uh, that equals minus uh, a half of j. You just multiply top and bottom uh, by, by, um, by j. Um, 
and, uh, and, and, and get that result because the J gives you a J squared, which is the negative. Uh, and this equals in polar coordinates, so it's a good idea to think about that for a minute, or in, in this exponential complex, is a half times e to the minus J of pi on 2. Because e to the minus J pi on 2 equals J, because this equals cos plus J sine, and the cos of minus pi on 2 is 0, and the sine of minus pi on 2 is minus 1, and that gives you that minus out the front. Okay, so this is the number that's out the front here. So the number that's multiplying the positive frequency is this number here, which has a phase of minus pi on 2. So there's an important extra element here uh, in our picture. So here we now realize that this was the magnitude, and I should, I'll put magnitude lines up here now that we recognize this uh, that this is a complex requirement. So this is the magnitude, and now we've also got to plot the phase. So I'm going to plot this for the phase of Wf as a function of f. Now for the positive frequency, the positive f2, we had this phase of minus pi on 2. So there's a phase here of minus pi on 2. And for the negative frequency, well, this number here goes in with this negative one, this negative out the front of this, this negative uh, multiplying by the half with the negative, that rotates the phase by pi. So we've now got positive pi on two for the corresponding to the negative frequency. Okay, so this is the important thing for a complex number, which is what we have in the frequency domain, because we're dealing with sinusoids and coses, which two different sinusoids, two different waveforms occupy the same frequencies or exist at the same frequencies. Therefore, we need their amplitudes as well as their phases. So we need the complex representation, amplitudes and phases. And uh, here we can see there's two plots now that correspond to each of these waveforms here. I haven't drawn the phase for this one, but for the cos, you can look at it and you can realize that the phase is zero for both of those. So if I drew the phase plot for Z, it would just be zero everywhere. You can confirm that to yourself using the same sort of logic as here. And the same thing for this uh, frequency, there would also be a corresponding sinusoid, uh, and therefore there's an amplitude and phase for those. So coming back to the Fourier transform, uh, now hopefully we understand this picture, you understand about negative frequency, which is really just this uh, phase component to represent the phases as well, because of the cos and the sine at every frequency. And the transform is a way of representing any waveform in the time domain. You could think of it as a summation of all the different sinusoids at different frequencies. That's one way to think about it. That corresponds really to the inverse Fourier transform equation. Or you could think of it as the summation of all the different frequency components that, co that make up the signal, and that corresponds to the Fourier transform equation. Again, I won't write the equations here, you can find the equations, or look at the links in the details below this video to find the video on the explanation of the Fourier transform equation. Hopefully this has helped you to understand more about the Fourier transform. Uh, if you've liked it, uh, please like the video, give it a thumbs up, it helps others to find the video. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the link, the web page link in the information below where there's a full categorized list of all the videos on the channel together with summary sheets, PDF summary sheets.